Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about some of the big time coaching carousels that went on this offseason. There were tons of hires and tons of coordinators and head coaches and everything in between. So I wanted to break down that for you guys real quick, but let's get to some spring overreactions and let's go back to the Big Ten. We did some of the big dogs, Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State yesterday, but still have a ton to break down. So I want to get to a couple other teams here and let's start with Washington and Jed Fish over there. I think Washington's going to have the toughest landing of any of the teams coming into the Big 12 or the Big 10, excuse me. You have Washington, Oregon, USC, and UCLA. Now, everyone expects Oregon to be the team. I, I think everyone expects them to be at the very top of the Big 10, possibly even win the Big 10 this upcoming year. USC is in a little bit sketchier of a spot, that's for sure. That defense is going to be very interesting, which we'll get to actually right after this, but. Um, I think they're in a better position from a talent standpoint than Washington is. And then you look at UCLA, and it's just the roster turnover has just been insane at Washington. And it's going to be a real uphill battle to replace everything that has to be replaced, whether you talk about offensive line where everyone left, defense where a whole lot of people left, including Jabbar Muhammad, who found his way to Oregon. So you've lost essentially every big-time player you had from a year ago. Um, Now, you brought in some great players. Jonah Coleman's going to be a big-time player. Will Rogers likely going to be their starter at quarterback. So there's ability on this team. I'm not saying they're going to, you know, totally fall off a cliff, but it's going to be sketchy, and I think it's going to be sketchy more because of the physicality standpoint. I think Big Ten teams are just going to be able to push them around a little bit more than they were able to, obviously, a year ago, but um, the way they... Definitely don't want to be uh, able to if you're Washington. I think it's going to be a little bit sketchy, but I do think in the future it's going to be very kind to the Huskies. I think 2025 and beyond will be more than fine. I just think uh, 2024 is going to be a little bit of a fight. But, you know, given what you had a year ago, I think Washington fans would trade that, to be totally honest with you. So, um, but let's move on to USC and let's talk about this defense. I think this defense is going to be top 80 in the country, and that doesn't sound very high. I get that. But when you look at them being 116th in total defense a year ago, that's a huge jump. Um, I think they will make a monumental leap, and I don't think it'll be it'll make them you know a dominant defense by any means. I don't think they'll be a, a team that you're scared to play defensively, but I do think they'll be opportunistic. I do think that they'll make plays. I do think Bear Alexander will have a better year than he did a year ago, and I just think there's more anger on this team I it sounds like a a weird way to describe um football in general or um defense but Lincoln Riley's teams in the past when you look at them playing uh pretty much going back to Oklahoma and into his USC years I think you look at the teams and it's not that they don't have talent it's not that they're not capable it's not that you know they don't have bodies on the defensive side of the ball even they don't play with any aggression it feels like at least in the past it felt like they just didn't play with a lot of aggression didn't play with a lot of passion didn't play with a lot of anger and it feels like every single video and every single clip I've seen from the USC spring game and the spring practices and everything like that has been that has been energy has been anger has been aggression has been all of the things that were not there for Lincoln Riley and I think DeAnton Lynn plays a huge part in that because that dude is hard nosed, that's for sure. So very, very excited about this group. But at the end of the day, I do think they'll be top eighty in the country, and I do think people will call it a failure, which is insane in its own right. I do think people will say, you know, he still can't coach defense. People kept hyping up Lincoln Riley and saying, you know, he's gonna flip this thing around and he's not able to do it. This is being able to do it. If they get into the top 80 in the country, this is a remarkable success for this USC team. It's not going to be a great defense. It's not even probably going to be a good defense, to be totally honest with you. But as long as it makes strides, I think we know that they're moving in the right direction, and I fully expect them to, to be totally honest with you. And then let's go to Wisconsin and talk about Tyler Van Dyke. This is a guy that burst onto his scene during his sophomore year at Miami and Ever since then, it's been really tough, Uh, whether it was injuries or just inconsistent play and just not playing up to his potential. It's been a really, really tough go of it. 2023 was not his best year by any means. So his 
goal for this upcoming year is obviously to get back to that so- uh, sophomore season form. And I think he'll be able to do that for a couple of different reasons. One, this Wisconsin team is going to be able to run the ball. Uh, pretty much period, end of story. When you have guys like Ches Malusi and Toby Walker and a really good O-line, you're going to be okay. Um, now, losing Braylon Allen is a tough, tough loss, obviously. But at the end of the day, they have plenty of bodies in that room. And if you can run the ball, someone like Tyler Van Dyke, who you know, struggled with accuracy and struggled with some of that uh, type of stuff is going to have much more room to make those mistakes and uh, you be able to be more accurate because the windows are going to be more open. So it'll be interesting to watch. Also, Phil Longo is really good at putting quarterbacks in the right situations, which is exactly what Tyler Van Dyke needs. I don't think he's necessarily going to light the world on fire or do anything that's going to make people jump out of their chairs necessarily. But I think this offense will run a lot smoother, both from a running and passing perspective. And I think Tyler Van Dyke will have a more than fine year and will definitely be able to run this offense very, very efficiently and uh, at least give Badger fans something to cheer for on the offensive side of the ball uh, going forward. But let's get into another quarterback over at Michigan State and Aiden Childs. And I am over the moon on this kid, and I think a lot of people are, because the athletic ability is off the charts, and Michigan State is not going to be a great team. I think that's not breaking news to anyone necessarily. They got absolutely gutted by this spring portal. If anyone got hurt the most, I think it was Michigan State, but they still have um, some talent in that building. I think they're slowly going to get better. I think 2024 is going to be a rather rough landing, but I think Aiden Childs will make it worth watching on Saturdays for sure, because this guy's going to make plays that is going to make your jaw drop. He is going to make your, he's going to make you jump out of your seat. He's going to make you like lose your mind on some of these plays because him running the ball is one of the most incredible things in the entire country, especially when you talk about the quarterback position. And then um, he's going to develop more and more as a passer. And that's going to take time, obviously more game reps and things of that nature. But it might not be the most consistent football in the world. There might be some missed passes. There might be some picks. There might, um, there's going to be some losses. Uh, There might be a lot of losses to be totally fair. But I think when we get to the end of the season, you're going to look up and see a couple of games where Aiden Childs just totally takes over, whether that's, you know, a small game against someone like Purdue or something or a big game like Ohio State or or one of the, you know, big, big dogs. He's going to be, the entire offense for them in one or two of these games and people are going to fall in love with him. And I don't know that he's going to be the outright favorite for the 2025 Heisman, but you'll find him on that list and you'll find him at odds that I think will be actually kind of nice to get after. So it'll be fascinating to watch this kid. I think he's one of the most athletic kids in the entire country. And I think he's capable of putting this Michigan State team in positions to win. I just think 2024 is going to be a tough time, but 2025, this kid could take off into a Heisman level season, to be totally honest with you. But then let's get to Iowa and let's talk about this offense. I think it's actually going to be good, uh, which is a crazy, crazy thing to say. And uh, uh, considering the last couple of years where it's been, you know, lifeless, let's be totally honest with each other. They've probably punted more times than maybe they've gotten first downs. I don't know. But at the end of the day, I think they're not going to be fantastic. I don't think they're going to, you know, light the world on fire. I don't think Tim Lester is going to come in from uh, Green Bay and totally change the way that Iowa plays football. But I do think they're going to move the ball. I do think they're going to punt less. I do think, uh, you know, Torrey Taylor, you know, now moving on to the NFL, but I do think their punter is going to be able to rest a little bit and not have to, you know, ice his leg every Monday. So, I think there's going to be ability there, and I think they're going to be able to move the ball. Tim Lester coming in is huge, and the good news for him is the bar is on the floor. Uh, You just have to be solid. You just have to move the ball. You just have to kick field goals, honestly. Kick field goals over and over and over again. At least you're putting points on the board, and uh, it's, it's going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be tough, but I think they'll be okay. Um, I think they'll be good. I, I think they'll give this team a better chance to win than any offense we've seen at Iowa for a little bit, uh, for sure, because uh, this defense was pulling all of the weight last year, and uh, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to see the offense kind of take some strides, and I think they will. I just think uh, it won't be overly pretty, but points getting on the board is points getting on the board, and that's kind of that. So it'll be fascinating to watch all of this stuff unfold. I think all of this is obviously overreactions. You know, you get into the spring and you want to be 
excited about something. So I'm trying to give people a little something to be excited about. I think um, there's a ton of stuff to pull away from this spring. There's tons of different storylines, especially around the Big Ten. We got into Jeremiah Smith yesterday. We got into a ton of different stuff around the big time teams, how Oregon is fully ready to kick down that door and be the team in the Big Ten this upcoming year. But We'll continue on this path with spring overreactions. We'll continue on probably to another conference the next time around, whether that's the Big 12 or the ACC. I'm not exactly sure yet, but we'll definitely keep revisiting these because it's always fun to overreact a little bit to spring, not get too carried away, but definitely have some fun with it. So, But we'll take our third break here, and when we come back, we're going to do a Spotlight Wednesday, and we're going to focus in on the Ole Miss Rebels. A ton riding on this year for Lane Kiffin, bringing in a huge portal class that is going to play a huge part, and we'll break down just how big of a part right after this, so stick with us.